Today I'm going to talk about twinning induced plasticity steels and finish off completely on transformation induced plasticity. Now we have seen that martensitic transformations cause a shape deformation and that shape deformation can be exploited to control uh, in particular the onset of plastic instability in steels via the trip effect. Now the shape deformation of martensite has a shear strain of the order of 0 0.26 but suppose that instead of martensitic transformation we consider mechanical twinning as serving the same sort of function as martensite does in trip steels and mechanical twinning has a much larger shear than martensitic transformation of the order of um, 0 0.07 as opposed to 0 0.26 in the case of martensite. So I'll begin by talking about twinning induced plasticity steels and then go on to discuss another effect in which we use the change in microstructure in order to eliminate residual stresses that can be detrimental to the steel or, or to the assembly rather. Okay, um, first of all uh, an explanation of mechanical twinning and this is one, one kind of mechanical twinning which is quite common. Uh, so we have a lattice here and we apply a shear deformation which causes one part of that crystal to reorient relative to the other. So we haven't changed the crystal structure. We have simply reoriented it by, by the shear deformation such that it reflects about this twin plane. Now there are different kinds of twinning but this is the one that we are interested in. So this is a twin and clearly that will cause a shape deformation and we'll talk about the magnitude of that deformation later. But like martensitic transformation, twinning can also occur extremely rapidly. And therefore, it is possible to get audible emissions from your material when twinning occurs. So I'm going to show you a, a movie, uh, which is more of a sound recording of clicks that happen, acoustic clicks that happen, when mechanical twins are induced in indium metal. So those clicks reflect the speed with which mechanical twinning occurs. And again, it's a coordinated transfer of atoms into a different crystallographic orientation. So let's look at uh, this uh, in a little bit more detail. So just like a slip system has a slip plane and a slip direction, a twinning system will have a twin plane and a shear direction that causes the lattice to reorient. So we define the twinning system by the plane on which it occurs. And in this case, I'm talking about twinning in austenite. Uh, so it happens on the 111 uh, austenite plane and the direction in which the shear is on that plane is a 112 type direction. And I'm going to show you now how uh, by passing Shockley partial dislocations on every closed back layer we can generate uh, the twin orientation without changing the crystal structure. So we know that uh, in the face center cubic or cubic closed back system, uh, we have these closed back layers of one on one planes, which are in ABC, ABC, ABC stacking, a uh, repeat of three. So let's begin with uh, this stacking sequence, ABC, AB and we are going to twin about this plane C and therefore that C plane is not at all altered. Now the notation ABC 
uh, is basically if you take a closed back layer, the next one is stacked in a position which is not exactly on top of the first one, but in the indents in the uh, lower plane. And though there are two kinds of those indents, and B is one of them, and then the next one would be in a C orientation. Okay, so we begin with our FCC uh, crystal, and we are going to twin it on this. And the first thing we do is we pass a Shockley partial dislocation here. And that takes uh, the A plane into the B plane, because this half is displaced with respect to this half by a Shockley partial dislocation. And therefore, we've changed the stacking sequence uh, in all of that region. We then uh, pass another uh, Shockley partial on this plane. And therefore, the C changes into an A position. Now, look what's happened here, that A, B, C, B, A. So this, the lower half now becomes a reflection about the twin plane of the upper half. And that is our twinning operation. Now, if, if I look at one of the closed back planes, then these are the indents in that plane that I talked about earlier, the B positions and the C positions. If I go from a B position to a B position, that changes nothing in terms of the stacking sequence uh, because A by 2, 1, 1, 0, which is the vector describing the displacement from there to there, is a lattice dislocation. In other words, it begins at a lattice point, ends at a lattice point, and therefore only achieves slip. It doesn't alter the crystal structure at all. Now you can divide this dislocation into two partial dislocations here, a by 6, 2, 1, 1, and a by 6, 1, 2, bar 1, which we came across earlier when we were talking about the cubic closed back to hexagonal closed back to transformation, where a Shockley partial was passed on every second closed back plane. And we had a shear strain as a consequence of 1 over root 8. Now in this case, we are passing the Shockley partial on every 1, 1, 1, every adjacent 1, 1, 1 plane. Uh, so the displacement is A by 6, 1, 1, 2, and the distance over which that displacement happens is the spacing of the 1, 1, 1 planes. So the magnitude of this is A over root 6, and the magnitude of uh, the despacing is A over root 3. And therefore, the shear involved is 1 over root 2, which is approximately 0 0.7071. So it's a very large shear deformation, and we ought to be able to exploit it to get better uh, ductility in our material by delaying the onset of plastic instability. Now, in order, uh, I will explain uh, the compositional changes that we need to make in order to get austenite, which deforms primarily by mechanical twinning. But first I'll show you the images. So here, uh, here is the surface relief uh, produced uh, when you take one of these uh, materials, uh, which is fully austenitic, okay? So when we deform it, there's no hope that it will transform into something else, uh, but it deforms by mechanical twinning and you get this very beautiful, extremely thin lens-like mechanical twins in the microstructure when you plastically deform. Of course, you also get some dislocation deformation as well, because remember we are dealing with a polycrystalline system and that can be messy because the grains have to maintain compatibility between, between adjacent grains. Now, why are these twins so beautiful, lens-like and extremely thin? Well, it's obvious from the discussion we had on martensitic transformation, that a thin plate shape minimizes the elastic strain energy in the surrounding region. And because the shear involved in twinning is so large, obviously the aspect ratio will tend to be very, very small. In other words, the plates will have a small thickness relative to their length. Now, as we pull the material, uh, we get this mechanical twinning. And I'll first show you the stress strain curve. Okay, so here you are. We start off with, uh, you know, quite a low strength and this is just an austenitic steel without any uh, 
precipitates, etc. And then the material begins to deform, and there is this persistent work hardening, which leads us to incredibly large elongations uh, with a final strength which is, you know, 1.2 gigapascals. Okay, so clearly there is a mechanism which is leading to work hardening, and it can't be the same as in uh, trip steels, where you know it's the formation of hard, high carbon martensite from any retained austenite that actually gives you the work hardening capacity. Uh, so what's happening here is that as you twin the austenite crystal, it subdivides the crystal continuously into smaller and smaller domains. Okay? So these are the domains I'm talking about. And this effectively is leading to a reduction in the grain size as we deform the material. So we call this a dynamic hole patch effect. And that gives rise to this kind of behavior where by effectively reducing the grain size, you are uh, getting a strengthening effect continuously. Okay. Now, these are quite remarkable steels. Uh, so you have something like 25 weight percent manganese. There are many variants of this, but roughly speaking, this is a, a good example. 25% weight percent manganese, 3% silicon, and 3 weight percent aluminum. I'll explain the role of the aluminum later. And they're known as TWIP steels, twinning induced plasticity, plasticity. Now, because we have these elements in large concentrations, and remember these are weight percents, in atomic uh, percent, these would be even larger. The steel effectively is a low density steel because look, the density here is 7.3 grams per centimeter cubed, which compares with 7.8 of a normal steel. And you know, there are actually alloys where you reduce the density by 15%. Uh, alloys like these, where you reduce the density by 15%, a massive reduction. And then, you know, basically aluminum cannot compete in terms of strength to weight ratio or, or cost, etc. So these steels remain fully austenitic during their deformation. You know, you can see this is a large amount of alloying additions and they maintain their attractive properties to cryogenic temperatures. So if you look at this, you know, the impact toughness energy is more or less independent of the test temperature. And that is very, very good because we can think about making, and indeed uh, there have been uh, these objects constructed, which are very large tanks to hold liquefied natural gas, okay? Uh, the current steels that we use are based on iron nickel alloys and nickel is expensive uh, compared with this steel. Okay, so the properties remain attractive to cryogenic temperatures and even at high strain rates, you know, 10 to the 3 per second. Uh, normally, you know, if something behaves well when you reduce the temperature, it also behaves well when you increase the strain rate because they have, they have uh, similar effects on the ductile brittle transition temperature and, and so on. Now, when the steels first appeared on the market, uh, they were implemented, but very quickly, uh, a major problem was discovered where, you know, for no obvious reason, when you form a component, and that's what you do when you, uh, when you want to make a complex shape, um, after a while, you get, in, this is a particular test uh, for residual stress where you draw out a cup and then you leave it and then it, it cracks after an unpredictable amount of time. And the cause of this cracking was identified as hydrogen effects, okay? Uh, so, you know, normally we don't think about hydrogen embrittlement in austenitic steels, or austenitic steels. But in this case, uh, the presence of the residual stress and the properties of the alloy meant that it suffered from hydrogen problems. And, you know, for a while, 
the Allies lost their reputation as a consequence. But this problem was solved uh, by adding this uh, aluminium to the alloy. And one way in which the aluminium works is that if you substitute it into the uh, lattice, and this is a projection of the FCC cell, then it creates uh, additional space which traps the hydrogen. Okay. So that problem is solved and uh, the steels are commercially available. They are uh, relatively expensive because you know the technology required to introduce so much manganese which has a low vapor pressure is, is uh, more difficult than making normal steels. Now, Given the nature of the stress strain curve that we saw, where you know you start off with a low strength and then it goes on and on for 60, 70, 80 percent elongation, uh, one idea was to use this uh, for crash resistance in cars. And one of the engineering devices that is designed in modern cars to absorb. Uh, energy when you have a sort of a head-on or, or a collision of two cars is that you have this uh, square-shaped beam which is designed to concatenate as it deforms and in doing so it absorbs a lot of energy okay so I'm going to show you a, a movie of uh, this square-shaped object being rapidly deformed to test for its ability to absorb energy. And on this side, we have a steel component, and this side is a composite, which absorbs energy by a different mechanism, by, by delaminating effectively. So here you go. This is uh, at about 14, 15 meters per second, okay? And this kind of behavior is engineered into the component. Okay, so it, when it concatenates, it begins to absorb uh, energy, and therefore, you know, there is a level of protection for the passenger compartment and the engine block and so forth. Okay, now, obviously, you know, trip steels with uh, the large amount of area under the stress strain curve might be good candidates for this. Okay. But the problem also is that the strength is really achieved after quite a lot of deformation, okay? Uh, whereas, you know, if you had a curve like this, you would absorb much more energy. So basically, you know, this level of deformation only occurs in these regions here. And that means that it's not actually effective uh, in absorbing energy because the deformation is very localized instead of uniform throughout the sample. So uh, a group of German engineers working for the railway industry came up with an absolutely brilliant idea, which is as follows, okay? So um, supposing you make a tube out of the trip steel, and then the tube is located at a die, okay? And then if a crash happens, the tube gets extruded through the die, so you get uniform deformation, and then uh, you know you utilize the full capacity of the trip steel. So the effect of the crash is to extrude the tube through a rigid die over here, and this uh, concept won the 2018 Steel Innovation Award. So here are the dies, and these are the tubes made from the TWIP TWIP steel. And this is the compartment of the uh, train where you can see these elements, which would all uh, tend to absorb energy as they're extruded through the die. Uh, so somewhere, if you look at the DLR website or, or search for Steel Innovation Award 2018, you can see a movie of an actual train crash test, okay? It really is quite spectacular. So, you know, in order to utilize a new material, you need people to think creatively on how to use it for the specific properties 
that the material scientist has developed. It isn't simply that you develop a material and then apply it to normal uh, applications. Okay, so uh, in both trip and trip, we are using the deformations that are induced by an external stress to enhance the work hardening capacity, albeit by different mechanisms. And we get, uh, therefore, a larger strength and a larger ductility, which normally doesn't work out. You know that if you increase the strength, the ductility often is reduced. But with these concepts, you don't lose that connection. Strength and ductility increase simultaneously. Now, I want to use this concept for a completely different objective. And that is that very often we develop stresses inside a component even before it is put into service. So you, you put a component on a table, it will contain an internal stress system, which we call a residual stress, which comes about for reasons I will explain shortly, but it effectively reduces your ability to apply loads to it because it already contains a system of stresses. So can we use the concepts of transformation-induced plasticity to combat that? Now, one of the major areas where stress is developed due to the fabrication is welding. And welding essentially means that you have two bits of metal and these are quite large chunky bits and uh, you pour liquid steel effectively. Uh, you don't actually pour it, but you deposit it by welding. Uh, and while it's liquid, of course, the two bits of metal which are joined to other structures uh, are not bothered. But when the liquid solidifies and then it starts to contract, it pulls on its uh, surroundings and that creates the residual stress. So it's a thermal contraction uh, in this localized region that leads to the development stress in a constrained assembly. And this is illustrated here. So imagine that this is our rigid constraint. Uh, you've got a large structure and you want to join two bits of that structure together. Uh, while it's liquid, there's no issue. It then becomes solid and then undergoes thermal contraction, which therefore pulls against this assembly, which is constrained. And that stress can reach very high levels, you know, of the order of uh, uh, a significant fraction of the yield stress of the material. So how can we compensate for thermal contraction? That's the question. And the sort of structures I'm talking about can be huge, you know. So for example, this is a, an oil rig in the uh, North Sea. And these are the pipelines uh, extending over Siberia, for example, uh, to carry gas and oil. And sometimes there are, uh, obviously, if they're carrying gas, they're under pressure. Okay, so there was a brilliant experiment done back in the 1970s by Albury and Jones, okay? And what they did was they made a tensile specimen uh, completely out of austenitic steel, so it doesn't undergo any transformation, heated it up to this temperature and held it rigidly. Now, as it cools, you naturally get the development of stress due to thermal contraction. So this is a fully austenitic sample, which doesn't transform. Then, then looked at a steel, which actually transforms into bainite. And you can see that initially the behavior is the same as the fully austenitic steel. But when transformation kicks in, you actually get a reduction in stress. Okay? And that's because the, the stress developed by thermal contraction is favoring the formation of certain crystallographic variants which comply with that stress and therefore relieve it. Uh, but when the transformation becomes exhausted, the stress again begins to rise rapidly. So that's, that's no good. You know, we've ended up with a large residual stress in this constrained tensile specimen. Uh, 
So then they looked at a martensitic steel, and sure enough, the same sort of behavior, but this time, because the transformation happened at a lower temperature, the final stress that we end up with is much smaller, much smaller than in the case of the bainite example. So the clue from this is that suppose you could reduce the transformation temperature sufficiently so that this point ends up over here. Then the problem is solved. Okay? And bear in mind that uh, the transformation is actually happening inside the welding alloy, not inside the adjacent steel. And because it's a welding alloy, you're only using relatively small quantities. So they can actually be expensive relative to the basic steel. But it also means that a vast range of other properties must be achieved in any alloy design. And there's no time to go into that, but all of these properties you would need to think about and to calculate uh, using techniques such as neural networks and so forth. In addition, to controlling the transformation behavior. Now, the only way to get the transformation temperature down low enough is to make the welding alloy martensitic. And immediately, you know, that will ring alarm bells in the minds of welding engineers because martensite is generally regarded as brittle, but I explained to you that the only reason why it can be brittle is if it contains a lot of carbon in solution. So why don't we make welding alloys which have more or less uh, zero carbon? So here's a series of welding alloys with very low carbon concentration. This is a commercial alloy, okay, which, uh, which doesn't actually transform at a low temperature. Uh, it's, it's there because we want to do a comparison against alloys here which do transform at a low temperature because they contain substantial amounts of nickel, for example, or chromium. And they should all give us a martensitic structure. Now, Aubrey and Jones did their experiment using this constrained uh, tensile specimen, which was a beautiful experiment, okay? Uh, but we are working with very small quantities of experimental alloys, and therefore we, we need um, and have access to slightly more sophisticated facilities which also allow us to monitor simultaneously and accurately the phase transformation behavior. And that of course is the X-ray synchrotron, which is a high energy X-ray beam. And we go to a synchrotron facility and attach a thermomechanical simulator on it, effectively like a dilatometer. And we can actually get the beam to penetrate something like five millimeters of sample. And here is the, uh, this particular experiment was done in Grenoble and the X-ray beam comes in through there and our sample is located uh, in this region. And this is the thermomechanical simulator attached to the synchrotron, okay? Now, if you have a good experiment to do, then you can write a case for using such facilities if you are in universities, uh, completely free of charge, uh, on the basis that you publish the results, which is not an issue. And in addition to the stress strain behavior, you, you can get a very clear idea of the phase transformations happening as your constrained tensile sample uh, cools. Of course, we are using X-rays, so we can work out phase fractions, lattice parameters, and even the partitioning of carbon if carbon were to be there. So now I'm going to show you the same sort of curves as the Albury and Jones experiment, because we had this thermomechanical simulator attached, which can monitor the stress in the sample. So first of all, the pink here, uh, these are just repeated tests when you see multiple pink lines. Uh, is the control alloy which transforms at a high temperature so we end up with a greater amount of residual stress. The low temperature transforming alloys uh, are these and they all lead to a small stress. 
at ambient temperature. So the concept undoubtedly works and you can now buy commercial welding alloys which will do this job. Okay, okay. Um, how do we prove that this actually works in a welded joint? And a welded joint is you know, much larger than the sort of specimens being studied here. So we need a diffraction technique which can penetrate a lot more material than x-rays or synchrotron x-rays. And of course that technique is uh, neutrons. So you go over to a neutron facility and this particular experiment was done at Chalk River in Canada uh, where you know this is the control welding alloy and these are the low temperature transforming alloys. If you look at this control alloy yeah, you've got uh, tensile stresses here, okay? Uh, and um, the low temperature transforming alloys give you compressive stresses. This is minus 600 megapascals uh, and so on. And of course, we've got the stress components in various directions, but just to, uh, sh uh, just to explain that we can actually study fully welded samples using neutron diffractions. Neutrons are able to penetrate a lot more because they're not charged particles. Now, these, uh, these alloys are not uh, stainless. And in some applications, uh, you need the welding alloy itself to be stainless. So how do we design a, a welding alloy that cancels residual, residual stresses and yet is uh, stainless? To be stainless, you need a concentration of chromium which is greater than about 12.8% because then you get a spontaneous chromium oxide barrier on the surface, which is also electrically insulating. And uh, uh, if, if, it's, if it's thick enough, it's uh, electrically insulating, which means that uh, it can, uh, which means that it protects the steel. But in addition, if you scratch, it will reform very quickly. So it continues to protect and that's what makes the steel stainless. Uh, the carbon concentration must be next to zero because uh, if the carbon combines with the chromium to form chromium carbides, then you're depleting the chromium locally and then you get corrosion attack at those locations. We want the martensite start temperature to be low, but we want the alloy to actually transform as far as possible and not leave uh, a significant amounts of retained austenite. And because we don't have carbon, we have to suppress the martensite start temperature uh, to low temperatures uh, using solutes which are substitutional because we are not using carbon. At some temperature, the alloy should be capable of becoming completely austenitic. So if you use too much chromium, for example, then it may be impossible to get the fully austenitic state. And generally speaking, um, Austenitic stainless steels become susceptible to embrittlement at very high temperatures by impurities. Uh, so it's good if some delta ferrite forms from the liquid because it can absorb some of those impurities. So bearing in mind all of these conditions and also the mechanical properties, uh, these stainless steels were designed as welding alloys uh, with virtually no carbon concentration here. And indeed the transformation temperature is suppressed and these are actual welded samples. This is the control material and you can see there's quite a lot of distortion. Now distortion is a reflection of residual stress. Uh, so uh, when I was describing the buildup of uh, accumulation of residual stress, I was talking about a constrained assembly. Uh, this is not a constrained assembly and therefore one, one of the plates is lifted up by the thermal contraction stresses. When we use the low temperature transforming alloy, we get much less of this distortion. So this finishes uh, the clever way in which transformations and mechanical twinning are exploited in order to control the properties and the state of stress inside your material. Thank you.